Do, do, do. Oh, hey, everybody. How are we all doing today? Welcome back to the show. Uh, brought to you by our sponsor, um, uh, uh, Buggy Brand Balls. Do you like some balls? Well, check out Buggy. He's got the best balls on the market. Chocolate, caramel, peanut butter, whatever brand of ball you like, Buggy's got it for you. Buggy's Balls. <laughs> Actually sounds like a really delicious cereal, you know? Okay. Well, anyway, uh, yes, today will be One Piece chapter 1101. Yeah, we're getting into the chapters that are starting to seem like binary code. I can't wait for chapter 1110. That's gonna be crazy, alright? Well, anyway, uh, One Piece is on the cover of Shonen Jump this week. We got Luffy on a snowboard. He's snowboarding Luffy. Uh, anybody out there snowboard? I tried skiing once, really messed up my knee for about a month. Everybody told me I was going to get hurt if I if I skied, but I had to try it at least once. I did it. I got hurt. Probably never going to ski again. But snowboarding looks fun. Cover page this week, we see Vegapunk and all of his satellites, which is remarkable because I thought like we would have already seen like them in, in uh, like the color palettes of each of the satellites. So we did, but we actually saw them in a uh, like an official One Piece YouTube video. There was like a preview for uh, the Egghead arc and we see the different satellites there and what their color palettes are. I think Lilith is going to show up in the anime this week, so we've kind of seen her in the preview. Uh, but yeah, for whatever reason, I thought Edison was red. Uh, Pythagoras is red, but I thought Edison was as well. Edison is actually green. He's like a little green robot. Uh, Lilith has like strawberry blonde hair. York is blonde. Atlas has pink hair. Like half of her hair is pink, half of it's white. Shaka's color palette is what you would expect. It's like a black uh, coat with like the yellow lines running on it. It, and then his helmet is like the zero one in yellow as well. Vega Force One is in the background. Vega Force One is this big blue robot, uh, which is unfortunate. It is destroyed now. I mean, I guess Vegapunk could always rebuild it. Um, but you know what? Looking at Vega Force One, I mean, it is a massive robot. It was able to pick up the Sunny in like both hands, right? And the Sunny itself is really big. So I think the estimations on Vega Force One is it's like at least 300 meters tall. It's really huge, right? But if you actually look at Vega Force One, especially in its legs, it looks remarkably like the Frankie Shogun, like a very similar design. Now, this does make sense because Frankie kind of like worked at Vegapunk's lab at Karakuri Island, and maybe it's a similar schematic. But also, I wonder, because the Frankie Shogun was mentioned to be made out of Wapo metal, the metal that Wapple developed with his uh, Baku Baku powers over the time skip, right? And he kind of built up his, like, empire, right? I wonder if Vega Force One is also built out of Wapo metal. It's kind of a weird thing with Wapple because he's a horrible individual, right? But in like a strange way, he developed an alloy that ends up working really well for the good guys. For like Frankie to develop the Shogun and Vegapunk maybe to develop Vega Force One. It's kind of like how Caesar setting off a nuke at Punk Hazard, obliterating the island in a weird way resulted in Bonnie being cured of her disease. Like Bonnie might just be dead if not for Caesar detonating that nuke on Punk Hazard. So it's kind of weird how things go in the One Piece world, but it's a really cool color spread, and then you have the main Stella body right there in the middle. Um, so, we continue on. We're still in the flashback, although I think the flashback is going to be ending the way that the narrator is kind of talking at the end of the chapter. It lends me to believe the next chapter is going to be back in the present, but who knows. Anyway, so, uh, Kuma arrived in the East Blue at Fusha Village, which is Luffy's hometown, and why was he there? The answer is pretty clear. He was there to see Luffy, yes. So, the way that this is going, this is now three years before the, the current story. So that means if you factor in the two-year time skip, this is one year before Luffy left Fusha Village. So Luffy is 16 years old at this point, okay? So this is interesting because we don't usually get, do a flashback this close to the start of the story. This is the closest we've ever gotten, really. Um, that's where just Kuma's story ends up ending out, right? Okay, it just ties into a lot of the mainline stuff before Luffy even set out on his journey, okay? So we see Kuma walking through the woods at Mount Cole um, he's like investigating something. He is looking for Luffy. And he's like, hmm, I wonder. These mountains are massive. All of these trees and hills. I wonder if I'm even going to be able to find him. Gabu Gabu no battle axe! Boom! And he's like, hmm... 
Yeah, I think he's probably over there. And so, you know, it doesn't take Kuma long because Luffy at this point, you know, Ace has already left on his journey. So it's really just Luffy out in the woods beating the crap out of the local Mount Colbo wildlife. Like the tigers and crocodiles and bears and everything out there. And uh, Dadan is there, but Dadan's like, to say Dadan is watching over Luffy at this point, I mean, Luffy's 16. Uh, he's basically on the same level he was when he left Fusha Village, meaning he's pretty damn strong. So, I mean, Dadan is basically there to provide Luffy with some food whenever Luffy shows up back at Dadan's place. Most of the time, Luffy probably spends several days out in the woods, out in the jungle, uh, you know, killing random wildlife and eating it. You know, that's probably what Luffy spends most of his time on. Anyway, we see Luffy display his battle axe technique. This is the same move he used to defeat Arlong and uh, just leaves a massive crater in Mount Colbo. You see the tiger and like a crocodile there that are like, oh! it, it's very similar to what we saw at the end of the time skip with Ruskina, where Luffy was training there and all those big animals were like, you know, bowing down to him after the, uh, the events of him training there and learning hockey and gear forth and everything like that. So very similar, just on a much smaller scale when he was training on Dawn Island, right? So you see... Kuma walking through the woods, and he's not, like, approaching Luffy to speak to him, but he is watching him from a distance, and he's there, and he reminisces, so we have a flashback in the flashback, just go along with it, where uh, he was talking to Dragon. So, you see Dragon and Kuma on the deck of the ship, back when Kuma was still a revolutionary, and they were in the Goa Kingdom. This might have been around the time that, uh, you know, maybe they went into Grey Terminal, it might have been before that or after that. The implication is that Dragon Dragon has been back to the Goa Kingdom more than once. It, it wasn't just the incident with the Grey Terminal, okay? Well, anyway, uh, Kuma is there just kind of talking to Dragon, and he's like, Dragon, you seem rather familiar with this island, you know? And it's odd enough, you know, I left earlier to stretch my legs. This is Kuma talking. He's like, I, I was, uh, you know, wandering the island earlier, and I found this little hamlet, this little village on the edge of Goa Kingdom, that's Fusha, and I saw this kid running around, you know, on, on the remote outskirts, okay? And then and then Dragon just cuts Kuma off and he's just like, hey, you know, if you keep this up, you might as well just kill me right here if you keep talking about this shit. And then Kuma's like, whoa, whoa what, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He's just like, because a child is a parent's weak spot. And at that moment, Kuma realizes he connects all the dots that Luffy, that boy that he saw in the village, is Dragon's son. And at this point, I'm assuming Kuma also has Bonnie as his child, and so he also kind of just shuts up, because he understands. It's like, oh, oh, okay, yep, nope, I will not say anything further about it. And Dragon's like, good. And then that's it. That was the end of it, okay? Now, a couple of things here. First of all, Kuma does not know Luffy has the power of the sun god fruit, okay? So the connection that Kuma made was not necessarily that like, oh, this kid who is Dragon's son has the power of a mythical zone of the sun god that I literally worship, okay? So that's not getting anything into it there. Although, it is rather poetic that Kuma did end up meeting, technically, the sun god Nika before he was completely transformed into a PX. You know, that is, a, that is still interesting there. No, the reason he went there was to see Luffy, okay? And it seems like to connect the dots there of like, that is Dragon's son, okay? Second thing I wanted to bring up here, the way that Dragon refers to Luffy here, a child is a parent's weakness. Now, this is something that is handled, it's a trope in fiction, and sometimes it's done well, sometimes it's not so much, uh, where it just becomes frustrating, where you'll have like a really strong character, right? And it's like, there's no way you could possibly beat this character. And it's like, wait a minute, what if we take their child hostage? The Liam Neeson trope or whatever. Although in that situation, Liam Neeson, <laughs> oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine if somebody found out Luffy was Dragon's son and they like captured him and then they called Dragon up and they're like, we have your child, Dragon. Turn yourself over to the world government or else we'll, and then Dragon just cuts him off and just like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. But I am Monkey D. Dragon. I will literally bring a maelstrom of pain upon you unless you let my child go. If you do, that'll be the end of it. But if not, I will summon a Category 7 hurricane with wind speeds over 500 miles per hour that'll rip your skin and muscle off your very bones! That'd be cool. But no, see, this is the interesting thing about Dragon here. Dragon does care for Luffy. He does love his son, okay? 
And in a in an ocean, uh, in an ocean where there are a bunch of deadbeat parents in One Piece, and in anime in general, where there's a lot of parents that aren't around for their children. You know what? I am not gonna say that about Dragon. I'm not even gonna imply that Dragon is like a deadbeat dad that like abandoned his child, okay? First of all, Luffy was not abandoned, okay? Luffy was raised by mountain bandits and his grandfather who threw him into jungles for multiple days at a time, forced to scavenge for food in the mountains with his friends, fighting against bears and tigers. <laughs> okay, the way I'm describing it doesn't sound that good. It actually sounds like the most horrible conditions for a child to grow up. But in the case with Luffy, he's fine. He's good. <laughs> no, but no. Luffy, Luffy was not abandoned, is my point, okay? Garp was watching over him. You also had Makino and, and Whoop Slap from the village. Even Dadan eventually cared for Luffy to the point where when Luffy left, Dadan was like weeping and just like, just get out of here, you fool. <laughs> all right, all right. But here's the point, okay? Dragon did not leave Luffy, did not leave being a parent for selfish reasons here. Dragon is literally the leader of the Revolutionary Army trying to fell a totalitarian oppressive government that has ruled the world for over 800 years. I think that's a good reason for Dragon to abandon being a parent, okay? Dragon is literally trying to abolish slavery worldwide, globally. The reason slavery exists is because the Tenrubito want it to exist. He's trying to get rid of the Tenrubito. It's, it's like, yeah, I'm going to abandon my son. And everyone's like, boo! But I'm going to free the entire world from an oppressive, uh, you know, uh, totalitarian regime and also, you know, uh, abolish slavery on a global scale. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, sta I, I give Dragon a standing ovation. It's like, all right, yeah, you got to abandon your son. But I I'd say saving the world without any respect of, like, hyperbole or exaggeration. Dragon is literally trying to save the world. Oh, you also know who gets a pass on this is, um, I'm not going to spoil the end of the story or anything, but in Full Metal Alchemist, Hohenheim. Hohenheim also gets a pass on the idea of, like, oh, I abandoned my child. for No, it was not for a selfish reason. This is a good reason. All right, Dragon. And you know what else is fascinating about this? One line that Dragon says is, a child is their parent's weak spot. That implies that if Luffy ever was captured and used against Dragon, it's like, hey, Dragon, your life or your son's life, pick one. Dragon kind of admitted here where it's like, he might actually choose to save Luffy and end himself. And if that happened, the revolutionaries gone. At like the head of the revolutionaries are cut off at that point. Yeah, you got Ivankov, you had Kuma and the other generals and the leaders and stuff like that. But if, if Dragon dies, the revolution's kind of done, you know? So to even imply that like Dragon, like if I was ever in that situation, I don't know what I would have done. You know, like I might have actually opted to save my own son's life at the expense of my own. Own, and that would have ended the revolution. So that's why he's like, no one can know about Luffy. Thank God the cipher pull ever, never found out about this. Kuma did. Kuma connected the dots pretty quickly because he knew Dragon as a as a friend. But if the cipher pull ever found out about this, oh God, they would have sent somebody to Fusha, Fusha a long time ago, grab Luffy and use him as like leverage against Dragon. Now. Now, that was only really an issue when Luffy was a little kid, you know, and he wasn't that strong. Now, Luffy at this point is 16. He's strong enough to, like, deal with his own stuff. And now in the story, it's even more so. Luffy is an awakened zone user. He's got gear five. He defeated Kaido. I mean, with a lot of help, but he defeated Kaido. Um, you know, Dragon doesn't need to be worried about Luffy being used as, like, a hostage anymore. But at this point, he definitely did. You know, at this point in the flashback, when, you know, Kuma's talking about about, hey, I found this this strange kid running around, you know, do you know anything about that guy? And then, you know, Dragon's like, you know, don't don't talk about that, Kuma. You know, it's like, that is my child. It's like, oh, okay, shit, I'm not saying a word then, okay? So, yeah, I, I like that one little panel of Dragon just admitting that in his own way, I do love my son, 
and a little bit of regret there. Like, ah, I wish I could have been there for him, but it wouldn't have worked. I, uh, Dragon is very pragmatic. He is a man on a mission. He is there to save the world, and he can't let any personal, like, he has no personal life, basically. Dragon has no personal life. The most he could do is whenever he's in the East, stop by and check on Luffy every now and then from the shadows. That's the best he could possibly do. He probably told his dad, he told Garp, he's like, hey dad, yeah, here's my son. You need to watch him. I have a revolution to run. No one can find out about this. And Garp is like, damn it! Why do people keep giving me their children to raise? You know, and so Garp went ahead and did it, though. And uh, that also explains why Dragon was at Logtown. That was not like, I don't think he showed up a lot to watch over Luffy. Maybe like three or four times as Luffy was growing up while the revolutionaries were in the East anyway, for other reasons. Maybe Dragon popped over to Goa really quick. I mean, if he has the power of the Storm God, he could just like, whoop! He's like, oh, Luffy doing all right? Ah, you know, dad's tossing him into the jungle. Okay, we're good. You know, it's like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, if that's the way it went down, it's like, oh, he's being raised by mountain bandits now. Yeah, all right, he'll be fine. You know, it's like that kind of shit, right? It's like maybe three or four or five times, and then he saw him off at Logtown. We're good, right? We're fine. It's fine. Okay, so um, Kuma is observing Luffy. Luffy, uh, at age 16, is like, oh, wow, you know, battle axe, that's an awesome finishing move, you know? I'm gonna wait to use that on a really, really strong enemy, because when I get my crew, they might try to take my crew away from me. I mean, I'm not gonna let them, but if they do, if they try to, battle axe to the face! Pretty much just telegraphing, like, like predicting the future events of Arlong Park there, because that's the technique Luffy uses to defeat Arlong. So, Battle Axe was kind of like base Luffy's version of the King Kong gun. Like, Luffy went to train with Rayleigh at Ruskina, and he developed Gear 4th, and his strongest move at that point with Gear 4th was the King Kong gun, okay? So, I guess at this point, Luffy just training on his own out in the wilds of Mount Colbo on Don Island, he developed the Battle Axe as like, that is my strongest move, and I'm only going to use that against a really powerful opponent. And sure enough, he uses it to take out the strongest pirate in the East at the time, which was Arlong, okay? But I love how it's like, if anybody, you know, my hypothetical crew that I do not have yet, I'm going to get a navigator, and she's going to have uh, orange hair, and uh, she's going to have a really tragic backstory, and she's going to be enslaved by this, like, fish guy. And then that fish guy is going to try to take her back, and then I'm going to battle axe him in the face! And then, like, the tiger and the crocodile are in the forest, like, is this guy crazy? And just like, I ah, <laughs> don't worry about it. I mean, Luffy, I mean, is Luffy? Yeah, kinda. Well, anyway, uh, that's, that's Luffy just training. And then, as Kuma's observing him from the tree line, uh, the Den Den Mushi he has is ringing, because that's the government giving him orders. And so Kuma immediately pops away using his pawpaw paw powers. Luffy turns, doesn't see anything there, and just like, whoa, what was that? I just... Felt like a chill running down my spine there, huh? Oh, there must be at least one strong enemy out in the woods. I better beat them all before I leave, you know, so Luffy only has one year left, okay? That also makes it funny, like, for the last year Luffy was there, he spent, like, training and, like, running around the, the whole forest of the mountain trying to find this really powerful being, this really powerful animal, I guess, that he never found because that was Kuma, right? So Kuma and Luffy never properly met. So when Luffy runs into the PX4 at Sabaody and then eventually the real Kuma shows up, uh, Luffy's like, who are you? And it's like, yeah, he he wouldn't have known because they never actually met, okay? But the reason Kuma was there was to see Luffy, was to see Dragon Sun. So Luffy is just like, all right, well, I, I gotta get back to training, and I guess I gotta fight more tough opponents on the mountain, and then I'll head out in about a year. And so that's how it goes. So Kuma got, uh, you know, the message he got from the government was basically, uh, some pirates attacked a merchant vessel. You need to go find the pirates who fled and defeat them, right? So we see a scene, though, of Kuma arriving at the merchant vessel first. The merchant vessel that was torched by the pirates, you know, there's a bunch of injured on board, and Kuma's like, oh, don't worry, I'll get him to a hospital. And this is a warlord here. This is warlord, the tyrant, Bartholomew Kuma, being like, we need to make sure to get these men to the hospital. And they're like, ah, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll take the heavily injured on ahead of, with me. You should follow, though. And then he pops away. Meanwhile, the government is, you know, as a Kuma, where are you? What are you doing? So while Kuma is fulfilling the job of Warlord, he's still a nice guy. He's still all about that humanitarianism. So he's still out there trying to save everybody. It's just that, unfortunately, you know, he still has to live up to that title of Warlord. So even though he's following orders, he's still going to help people when they need 
need it, okay? So he's like, all right, I'll go defeat the pirates that attack this ship, but I gotta help the people on the merchant ship get to the hospital. And the government's like, that's not what we ordered, but... Uh, okay, hurry up, you're here to defeat the pirates. You know, it's like, all right, whatever, I'll get to it. And we do see a scene where Kuma rolls up to the pirate ship, and he just says, Hey! Oh, God, it's the tyrant Bartholomew Kuma! It's like, turn yourselves in. Give him everything we have! All of it! I'm so sorry, Kuma, please don't kill us! He's like, I'm not gonna... All right, fine. You think Kuma every once in a while has to, like... <coughs> I am Bartholomew Kuma. I am the tyrant. Ah! All right, I guess. Come on, on board, and you know, I'll bring you back to the government or whatever. You know, quit being pirates now. Quit being mean. He's sailing around the seas, and he's continuing to write letters to Bonnie, and he's saying that, like, you know, the world is full of so much beauty and splendor that you simply cannot capture it in just photos or in a letter or picture books. Like, the world is such a big beautiful, wonderful place, and I can't wait until the day comes where you are cured, and then I'll be able to take you out to see, and you'll be able to see all of it for yourself, okay? So he's writing all these letters, and now we cut back to the Sorbet Kingdom, where we're gonna stay for pretty much the rest of the chapter. So Bonnie is uh, about to turn nine at this point, so her treatment is, you know, she's done the six months of treatment at uh, Punk Hazard, and she's about another six months into her treatment for the recovery, so she's got like another six months left. It's like nine and a half. When she's nine and a half, that's kind of when her treatment is done, okay? So she's checking the mailbox every day at the church looking for Kuma's letters, and unfortunately, all of them have been intercepted by Cypher Pole 8, so by Alpha. So she's taking all of the letters that are being delivered. Uh, she mentions that Kuma delivers about 10 of them a month. Oh my god, he's such a good dad. And then Alpha's not even reading them. She's just ripping them all up and just throwing them in the incinerator every single time. Okay, so you have the you have the other characters there, like Yo-Go is there, the big fisherman guy who's eventually going to be a member of Bonnie's crew. You got Connie there, so she does have company. It's not just her and the Cypher Pole 8-8. Agents, but they've set up that like barrier around the church and like the guardhouse so like everything has to go through them first so whenever the news coups deliver the paper and the letters they have to go through alpha so alpha delivers the papers but rips up all the letters right so um, it's pretty sad. Now, let, let's talk about Alpha for a moment, though. So, Alpha looks remarkably like Califa. Um, by the way, here's Califa if she ate the giraffe fruit. There it is for you. But anyway, yeah. So, uh, people have thrown out there, what if Alpha is either Califa's sister or her mother or her clone? And there's a bunch of things on the table here. So, what's rather interesting is uh, Califa's father... Uh, is a guy named Lashkey, and he was a former member of Cypher Pole 9. He was a Cypher Pole 9 agent during the O'Hara incident. That's Khalifa's dad right there, okay? So, uh, it was mentioned in the SBS that a lot of the Cypher Pole agents that are collected by the government are basically orphans. They find orphans on the street and just basically take them and then train them in the arts of the Rokushiki, and then they raise them to be agents for the government, right? Well, in some cases, like in the case with Khalifa and her dad, that's kind of like the family business is like, you know, Lashkey was an agent and then had a daughter and then the daughter grew up and also became a Cypher Pole 9 agent. So, um, Alpha here looks remarkably like Califa. You could say that Califa had like a twin sister or a sister around her same age and I think that would work. But you could also say this is Califa's mom because, you know, Califa's only like in her late 20s. Uh, if Alpha, if you want to say Alpha's like in her 50s even, I mean, she looks good, but a lot of other characters in One Piece, like Shockey's in her mid-60s and still has it going on, you know what I mean? So like you could say this is Califa's mom or her like big sister, little sister, or maybe a clone. I don't think it's a clone, but I do think she she is related to uh, Califa in some way. And that would make sense if, like, Califa's dad was a member of Cypher Pole 9 and her mom was a member of Cypher Pole 8, which is the one rung directly below that in terms of, like, um, important missions that they're put on and everything like that. So, yeah, that's just the thing about Alpha right there. She, you know, is probably related to, you know, Califa in some way, but which way? Because their whole family are all kind of secret agents for the government, okay? I'm sure, like, her grandfather was and, like, everything like that. Um, so, so 
as we see the letters being shredded and thrown in a trash bin, is like one last thing, Bonnie. You're probably sick of me saying this, but I love you so much and I hope we'll get to see each other again soon. So it's just the most tragic thing ever where not only can Kuma not see his daughter, uh, he's given that up and he's given away his humanity, but he can't even like write her a letter and have her have her read it. You know what I mean? It's just the worst possible situation for Kuma and for Bonnie here, okay? So uh, there's a scene in the church where uh, Bonnie is like, yeah, hey, yo, yo, let's wrestle, let's train. So she uses her distorted future technique to get all big and buff and then goes to fight Gyo Gyo and Gyo Gyo's like, oh, hold on a second, Bonnie, let's just play with Jenga. Boom! <laughs> just like, so they're, they're wrestling and then uh, Alpha walks in and then Bonnie turns back into a kid and so Alpha for a moment is like, wait, what? I just... Was Bonnie just a massive, like, you know, muscular professional wrestler just now? What, what just happened? Uh, whatever, it was probably nothing. My eyes are just playing tricks on me, I guess. Whatever. Um, and so we, we have a scene here where Alpha is giving Bonnie medicine. And uh, she, you know, Bonnie is like, ah, the medicine's bitter. I hate this. And then uh, Alpha is like, well, you know what they say. The more bitter the medicine, that means it's working. <laughs> just kidding. This silly child doesn't understand. It's actually just a really bad lemon-flavored Ramune. <laughs> so it's a placebo. It's not real medicine. So yeah, that whole thing I went on in the last review where I'm like, well, Alpha is probably like an actual nurse, like the training, you know, the same thing that like, um, you know, the Cypherpool 9 agents that infiltrated Gali La, they were actual shipwrights. No, Alpha is just like, uh, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm here to observe Bonnie and make sure she doesn't leave to use as leverage against Kuma. And then I'm just going to feed fake, you know, med not real medicine, just like Ramune to um, uh, Bonnie there. Uh, now, Gyogyo goes over to Connie, uh, Grandma Connie, and is just like, hey, uh, Connie, why are we hiding Bonnie's devil fruit power from the nurse? And so they're unaware. They actually, I mean, it's so obvious that they're secret government agents. It's so obvious. But I guess they don't know that yet. So Connie is like, mm, nah, just to be, like, she has a suspicion that they are, but she can't prove anything other than the fact that they're clearly secret agents for the government. <laughs> but it's like, mm, just, you know, just that we just want to make sure we keep our cards close to our chest, as it were. Let's not reveal everything about the situation, okay? Let's just be careful. And Gyo Gyo's like, okay, whatever. So we cut back to, uh, I lied actually, we do cut back to Vegapunk's lab in one scene here where uh, we actually see Stussy, or rather the clone of Stussy, or rather the clone of Miss Buckingham Stussy, who is just referred to as Stussy. Right. So Kuma is undergoing the latter stages of his uh, conversion into being a cyborg, okay? So they're going over everything. Uh, we see Egghead that's been built up a little bit more now. We see more buildings. Although Vegapunk does mention that most of the town is still holographic. Um, and this is after the point where Vegapunk's head has been severed. So we see the apple head, all right? So that all happened within the span of like a year, a year and a half from Vegapunk having this giant head and then cutting it off and then having Punk Records as the brain. And so they mention that the brain is ready to go, it just needs to be lifted into the sky via the, the uh, island cloud. So they have yet to build like the island cloud generator, but once they build that, they will create the labo phase. So the labo phase and everything is a relatively new thing that's only been around for like three years or so. Okay, a little less than that actually. So anyway, yeah. Uh, he also mentions, you know, I, pl I planned Punk Hazard to be like this too. <laughs> Unfortunately, Caesar, you know how it is. He's a really difficult guy to work with. I wonder what he's up to right now. Eh, probably nothing. Anyway, um, so uh, we see Stussy, we see Kuma there. Kuma's on the table, and uh, this is a really sad scene, honestly, because we're getting to the point where all the modifications are pretty much done in terms of his physical body. Now, obviously, Vegapunk is waiting to the very last minute to convert Kuma completely, as in removing his personality, okay? Uh, he's leaving all the brain surgery stuff for the very end, okay? Uh, Stussy has a line there where she says, I wonder which one of us has the more checkered fate. The human that lacks free will or the clone that doesn't. So I guess the implication there was like, mm, you are going to become a cyborg with no free will. I am a clone also with no free will. And then Vegapunk's off to the side like, Stussy, knock it off. You're a human just like all of us. I made you with the same damn material. It's not like you're made out of something that's foreign from another dimension. You're made out of the same lineage factor as other humans. You're fine. So Stussy is kind of a little bit sarcastic with it, with like... 
I'm not real. I am just a clone. It's like, oh, you're a human. Get over yourself. <laughs> just like, okay. Well, uh, anyway, what is rather tragic, though, is Kuma's there all hooked up to everything. And he's like, um, hey, Vegapunk, uh, what should I expect? Like, like, what's it gonna be like when I get my personality removed? Like, what's that, what's it gonna feel like? And Vegapunk's like, ah, well, I'll give it to you straight, Kuma. You know, right now you're, you know, very loyal to the world government. You have that reputation. You know, whatever the government tells you to do, you do it. However, you still have your, you, you still have the upper limit of things you're willing to do, right? Like, if the government asked you to murder a child, even if Kuma was given that order, I don't think he could do it. I mean, that's, that's a big thing to ask somebody. Even with the whole situation with Bonnie and everything, Kuma would probably not be, at, would not be able to murder a child in cold blood if the government asked them to. But he says... Once I completely remove your personality, you will lose your memories, your empathy, your humanity, anything holding back. So when you are given an order, you will fulfill it. No questions asked, no matter how reprehensible it is. Uh, at least Vegapunk is, he's at least telling Kuma, hey, he, he's not lying to him. You know, it's like, hey, Doc, you know, what's this going to be like when you remove my personality? Vegapunk's not going to lie to him and be like, oh, you won't, it's nothing. You, you don't just, you'll be going on the same as you always were. Don't worry about it. No, he's telling him straight up what this is going to entail. I think he owes it that much to Kuma, right? Um, that being said, you should retain some degree of free will until the process is fully complete. That'll give you one more year. So I like to think, uh, and this is getting to the point now, we're getting very close to like uh, uh, Bonnie's ninth birthday and everything. So the idea is that when Kuma met the Straw Hats at Thriller Bark, or later on at Saba Odi, he already had undergone some of the personality removal surgery, okay? He was still himself, but not 100%. And you could definitely tell that there's more, like, like, and you could definitely tell that because there's more, like, personality, more, like, vibrance to his expressions here before the surgery begins than later on when we see him at Sabaody. He doesn't really smile anymore. He's just this cold, stoic being, still has a little bit of the Kuma inside of him, but it's like maybe only like 30 or 40 percent than his original personality. And then in at Marine Ford, he gets his personality completely removed, and then he is zero percent. He's just an unthinking cyborg now. So it, it is a really tragic thing here. But Kuma is like, all right, well, at least I, at least as, as long as I have free will, I'm gonna keep writing letters to Bonnie up until the end. And uh, Bonnie deserves to know how I feel, and I want to send her a whole lifetime's worth, worth of, of love before this is over. And then Stussy's there, and she's just smiling, like, oh my goodness, that's so sweet. You know what's really tragic? I wonder if even after Kuma had all of the like stuff removed from him like all these letters were like really highly detailed like oh bonnie the world is such a beautiful place you know it's so glorious out there and like there's you can't properly paint a picture of how beautiful this sunset is bonnie and the letter just goes on and on and on this is really sad but what if the more humanity that was removed from kuma as the surgery went on he still wrote the letters but they got shorter and shorter and less human they became like, oh, this glorious sunset is beautiful, Bonnie. Bonnie, today I saw a bird. It was pretty. Love, Dad. And then they even get more where it's like, Bonnie, I am writing you this letter to express that I miss you and would like to see you someday. Love, Dad. You know, it's just like, it's... They get slowly and slowly more robotic because he loses his sense of humanity. That's really tragic. I don't know why. That's not even in the chapter. That's just my own headcanon. I don't know why I did that. I just made myself sad for no reason. More sad than this chapter already is. Anyway, uh, uh, let's go do something fun. Birthday party! Bonnie's ninth birthday party. All right, so we cut back to the village. All of the fishermen and then Connie is there. And like, happy birthday, Bonnie. We made you a giant ultra deep pizza. And Bonnie's like, yeah! <laughs> and then starts eating the pizza. It's a magnificent birthday. Everybody's happy. But of course, the one thing she wanted was a letter from her dad. And so she's there. Look at late at night. Everybody's asleep. She goes to the mailbox and she's like, Dad, I'm nine now. You said you'd write. I'm like, oh my God, this is so damn tragic. Ah, oh, God. And we see again Alpha just ripping up the letters and just like, oh yeah, ninth birthday, whatever. Who cares? 
Um, we do see a brief scene of Baltigo with uh, Sabo and uh, Dragon, and they're talking about how whenever they're in like a tight spot somewhere in the world, Kuma will show up and save them and like fight for them and help them, the revolutionary out, but then they'll leave. Uh, the like, Kuma will just leave after that and like no explanation, no questions. They'll not like, he's like, Kuma, why are you here? He'll just leave. And so Dragon is like, I'm sure he has reasons for keeping us in the dark. We best not pry, you know. So, so Kuma is still right up until he loses everything. Is still doing his best to make the world a slightly better place and to help out his friends. But he's just so like both physically and metaphorically, and I guess emotionally, like handcuffed to what he can or cannot do. You know. So we do see them briefly. So now. We're about nine and a half years, uh, you know, well, Bonnie is nine and a half years old. So that means we are half a year from the start of the story. We're like six months before Luffy leaves Fusha. All right. So Bonnie, we see her completely cured of the sapphire scale. All of the scabs, the, the scales on her face are gone. And you know, so that was the six months of treatment and now a year of the recovery. So she's like, I can go outside now. And Alpha's like, no, you cannot go outside. I was given strict orders to watch you until you turn 10. And she's like, no, you liar. That's, that's not true. Old man Vegapunk said a year and a half and I was eight. And that's you know, was a nine, a nine and a half. I'm ready. I could go outside now. And so they're, you know, yelling at, you know, they're yelling back and forth. But then we have Connie here. Connie is the most amazing grandmother in the world, okay? Connie is like, okay, everybody come over here, you know? And so she, she calls over Bonnie and all the fishermen and everybody in the, in the church. And she's like, all right, listen. Alpha and the others are all government agents. What? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's crazy. I don't know why you couldn't have seen it earlier. But anyway, yeah. some, um, some of the agents were speaking in town. They were getting drunk at the local pub, and they let it slip that they were actually Cypher Pole 8 agents. Go figure. The world government's oddly incompetent sometimes. Anyway, um, we're going to get Bonnie out of here. And she also tells Bonnie, like, hey... Your dad definitely wrote you letters. There is no way that Kuma did not write you a single letter. They were clearly intercepting them and clearly destroying them. And Bonnie's like, yeah, I thought so. Is like, okay, don't worry, dear. We will get you out of this church. We will, don't worry. So the plan is they are going to uh, take the, the group of the strongest fishermen on the island. Okay, so it's Kyogyo, who's like the big guy, this dude right here, and then there's also Tots, uh, and then Potato. Uh, I'm imagining it's like Tater Tots and Potato, because Tater Tots are a potato-like dish, maybe. And Gyogyo, Gyo just means fish, so it's like fishermen, right? So Bonnie mentions, or Connie mentions, oh yeah, these fishermen, they're the strongest fishermen on the island, but oh, don't let that reputation fool you. They're really, really strong. They might even give a sea beast a run for their money. So, you know, Gyogyo is, he's like a strong guy. Guy, but they're just like local fishermen. But if worse comes to worse and they had to fight for the death or they had to be a pirate crew, they would be good, they would be good people to have, right? So they're like, don't worry, dear, we'll get you out of this church and you'll be able to go see your dad, okay? So we have the next scene where Connie is leaving the church and she's carrying like a bunch of luggage behind her and then she there's alpha because they're like waiting at the gate like no one could come in and out of the church without you know going through alpha and the uh, the cipher pole eight uh, cordon. So Connie's leaving and she's just like, well, I'm, I'll be going back to the palace now. And, you know, it's funny. I thought that like there was a suitcase she's holding behind her. I thought Bonnie was in the suitcase originally, but that's not the case. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Alpha was like, oh, yeah, sure, Connie, go back to the castle after I look inside this briefcase. And it's just like a bunch of random like clothing and stuff. It's like, oh, OK. Well, you're, you're good to go then. And she's like, oh, thank you, dearie. It's actually Bonnie. Bonnie used her powers to become an old woman, swapped her hat and her clothing with Connie. That's where Bonnie got her signature hat, by the way. The hat that we see Bonnie wear in the, at the uh, Sabaody when we first introduced her to her, uh, that's Connie's hat. All right, so it's just there you go, right? So there's that. So she's walking out, and as... Bonnie is leaving the church for the first time. She looks up at the world around her. She's never really been outside before. I guess she was outside when she was a real little kid before the Sapphire Scales took over when she was like around four. But she looks around and she's like, oh my God, this is what the grass is. This is the sky. I can be under the sun. This is amazing, right? So she's so happy. So she runs over to the docks 
and you have uh, Gyo-Gyo and Tots and Potato there and a bunch of the other fishermen, and they've taken an old fishing boat, and they've decorated it to look like a pizza. Now, it does look very similar to Bonnie's flagship, the Jewelry Margarita, after Margarita Pizza. However, it doesn't look exactly the same. It looks a little smaller. So I think this is like just their first attempt, like them just like slapdash putting a coat of paint over a fishing boat, and this is the proper ship they're going to get later. Also, we see the uh, Jolly Roger is not the same Jolly Roger that Bonnie will get later. This Jolly Roger is just a, uh, like a fish skeleton. Like you debone, like not debone, but you like you, um, you know, uh, cut a fish's like skin off to like prepare a fish. You'll got like just the bones and stuff. It's that with like the Jolly Roger cross over it, okay? So there's that. She runs off and she's like, yay, let's go out to sea and find my dad. And so she runs off. Meanwhile, back at the church, Alpha figures out that she's been bamboozled and is just like, where is Bonnie? And then you just see Connie there wearing Bonnie's clothes and just like, I am Bonnie. It's like, no, you're not, you old hag. Ah, you think you can get away from me? Oh, I am Alpha Cypherpole 8, the strongest of the Cypherpoles that most people know about anyway. So last scene of the chapter, double page spread. Alpha goes sprinting towards the docks using Soru, jumps into the air using Geppo, zipping through the sky, heading straight for that ship, ready to take them all out. And that's when Bonnie looks up and she remembers her father dancing the sun god Nika dance and just asking her father, Dad, what did the sun god look like? And Kuma's like, well, nobody knows, Bonnie. But it was said that he has a body made of rubber, and he could take any form that he wants, and he could fight any way he wants. And so Bonnie utilizes her power, which is still kind of really confusing, distorted future. She grows a giant fist. I can't escape it, can't I? I always am going to go, it's always going to go back to the SpongeBob ref. Here comes the giant fist! distorted future Nika mode boom and just punches Alpha right in the face she goes down like boom glasses shatter she gets knocked down into the water and the government would soon receive word that their hostage Bonnie has escaped out to sea to find her father like Luffy and the others her vessel would gain fame it would go from being a humble fishing boat to an infamous pirate ship of the new era. End of chapter, break next week. So we see Bonnie heading out to sea uh, about six months before Luffy did. Her story is very similar. Luffy went out to sea in just a tiny little dinghy and it ended up evolving into the Going Merry and then eventually the Thousand Sunny, a ship well known throughout the world. Same thing, Bonnie headed out in a small little fishing boat. It's eventually going to become the Jewelry Margarita. They're going to get a bigger ship, a bigger crew, and it started with just a nine-year-old child and a bunch of fishermen from a local village and that's how she begins her journey. This, this is the fascinating thing about One Piece because because honestly, you could focus on Bonnie as the main character of a manga, like a side story, just like you could Kobe, okay? And it's like, dude, this would be fascinating to read about. You know, like Bonnie's adventures going out to sea, uh, and Kobe's adventures being a marine, any of the supernovas, really. Well, except for Drake. I don't really care about Drake. Um, Drake is really... I I'll tell you what, guys. I don't know where your current rankings of the supernovas are, but after Wano... Drake went right to the bottom. I really don't care about that guy's life. Do you guys care about that guy's life? Maybe you do. There's like a couple people like, hey, I care about Drake. I really want to see what happened to him. It's like, yeah, yeah. Drake went way to the bottom. He's even lower than a Rouge right now. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, like a Rouge even. It's like, it's like the mystery aspect. We don't even know about a Rouge. All right, but anyway, yeah. So Bonnie's heading out to sea there. H how can her ability, how does her power work? Like distorted future. Can she just like basically make her body look like whatever she wants? That might actually be the case because the idea might be like the future is unwritten. It can be anything you want it to be. There's like infinite possibilities in the future, right? So maybe Bonnie is either number one tapping into the idea of like the infinite possibilities and she can for at least a temporary amount of time make her body look however she wants. Maybe she could grow wings. She could be like in a future where I'm a Skypean and grow wings and fly away. Maybe she could, you know, or it's like she's tapping into actual parallel universes like a 
parallel universe where she gets really buff, or a parallel universe where she ate the Gamu Gamu no Mi and got the Sun God powers. You know, maybe she's doing that. I don't know, like parallel timelines or something. I don't know, but it seems pretty damn powerful to me, if you ask me. So, um, she's gonna go off and be a great pirate, and, uh, yeah, that's the end of the chapter. So, uh, yeah, uh, we've got some stuff to talk about here. We gotta discuss, uh, things involving, uh, Dragon and the way he, maybe he views Luffy. Because I was really fascinated by that early part of the chapter. A big theme lately has been the whole idea of like, you know, oh, these are our children. And even though we're not around, like Kuma's not around Bonnie anymore, Dragon's not around Luffy. Uh, they still care and do love their children. It, it's just that they have other things going on for the protection. In a, a certain way, you can look at like Dragon wanting to protect his son. And then eventually when the revolution is complete, maybe Dragon will go see Luffy. In fact, after all of that is said and done, Dragon has finished his revolution that's lasted almost 30 years and the Tenerabito fall, maybe then he'll finally go and sit down with Luffy and have a conversation. Would Luffy, would Luffy particularly care about that? I don't think Luffy would really all be broken up in tears or anything about it. Like, Dad, you're finally home. Like, it's not really like that with Luffy, but it would be cool to see the two of them talk, at least a little bit, right? Well, anyway, that's for later on in the story. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching, signing out. Bye, everyone.